It's Wednesday, August 8th. It's Paul Joseph Watson. This is InfoWars Nightly News coming up on the show tonight. Tonight, a gun owner saves a cop's life by shooting a deranged man in early Texas. Then, a federal court upholds the hurting of demonstrators in the free speech zone. Meanwhile, the Washington's blog reports that Homeland Security coordinated an 18-city police crackdown on Occupy protests. Plus, full-spectrum evil, the secrets of global domination. Special report by Alex Jones. And Rob Dew talks to Liz Reitzig of rawmilkfreedomwriters.com. That's up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Top story tonight, Parkinson sufferer arrested for not smiling at Olympic men's cycling race. The spectator seeks an exoneration after he claims he was arrested for not smiling during the 2012 London Olympic men's cycle road race. Mark Worsfold, 54, a martial arts trainer who suffers from Parkinson's disease, wants a letter of exoneration after what he claims was a gross overreaction on the part of Surrey police. Worsfold explains, I was sitting minding my own business before I knew anything. The police grabbed me off this seven-foot wall, threw me to the floor and cuffed me. So all I saw the cycle race was between the feet of the people from the pavement. And basically, this guy's got Parkinson's disease. He's, his face is expressionless. He can't have an expression on his face. And according to The Guardian, Worsfold says, Surrey police, quote, questioned him about his demeanour and why he had not been seen to be visibly enjoying the event. They arrested him on charges of breach of the peace, saying Worsfold's behaviour, quote, caused concern. So there you have it. I mean, you know, we pour ridicule and scorn on Stalinist North Korea for arresting people who don't display the proper level of public grief, you know, in the aftermath of the death of Kim Jong-il. They cart them off to concentration camps if they don't cry correctly. And yet we've got almost the same thing now happening in Britain. This guy who physically cannot smile because he's got Parkinson's disease is sitting watching a cycle race and the cops arrest him for not visibly enjoying the event. <laughs> I mean, that it was an actual breach of the peace. They said he was actually protesting because he wasn't smiling, you know, like a smiley face slave throughout the event. And it's par for the course because this Olympic Games in London has been used um, to hijack a sporting event and basically turn it into a huge pageant and worship of the state. And... You know, there's Union Jacks everywhere, there's St. George's Cross flags everywhere, because the people have been permitted, they've been authorised by the government to fly them. You know, so long as it's worshipping the state, worshipping the royal family, if you fly those same flags outside of the authorised, permitted time period where the government says it's OK, then you can be branded a racist. There's actual cases in Britain where people have flown the St. George's Cross flag uh, and been ordered by their local councils to take it down because the flag was deemed offensive to minorities. So now it's official. If, if you don't exhibit the behaviour of a slave who's lost the ability to think for himself and hasn't been completely brainwashed in this pageant worship of the state called the Olympic Games, with all its um, attendant Nazi-like rituals, you know, carrying the flame through the towns and all that, as we've spoken about before, you know, if you don't fawn over people who throw big sticks and jumping into sand pits and ride bicycles, then you will be targeted by the thought police. Man arrested for not smiling during the Olympic Games. Can it get any crazier and more North Korea-like than that? Here's another crazy story. Abortionist sees aborting ugly black babies as a service to the taxpayers. Now, they've got this video of a pro-life Christian group confronting an abortion doctor. The doctor says his abortions save taxpayers money, prevent shootings like the one in Colorado, and rid the world of ugly black babies. So let's go to the clip. Okay, you get it? You would rather profit off of those children? No, 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 I'm not profiting. I, as a taxpayer, do not wish to pay for those babies to be born oh, and do. brought up and kill we those do. people in Colorado. Go ahead and pay for we that. Do. Let me see you adopt one of those yes, ugly black babies, okay? We do, we do, we do. You tell Listen. us, we'll adopt them. Yeah, go ahead. Adopt we'll those babies, give okay? Us a chance. Take them off the taxpayer's money, chance. okay? Give us a chance to adopt them. 
So there you have it. Basically, they confront the abortionist, and he says, why do you want all these ugly black, black babies? Taxpayers just going to have to pay for them anyway. And then, of course, they all go on to commit mass shootings like the one in Colorado. It makes perfect sense, right? Well, it goes right to the heart of um, what we've discussed many times, which is what abortion is all about at its foundational level, which is modern-day eugenics and racism. Of course, you can trace it back to Marie Stopes, and even before that, Marie Stopes was this uh, big women's rights activist who is celebrated in Britain. They put a face on the stamps and everything. And she was the person who helped open the uh, first abortion clinics in Britain back in the 1920s. And by the 1930s, she kept herself busy by writing love letters to Adolf Hitler uh, while advocating uh, compulsory sterilization of non-whites and other people with, quote, bad character. This is the woman that's the big denizen of the uh, women's rights movement in Britain. And now her charity, Marie Stokes International, uh, advertises in women's magazines through these public relations articles, encouraging women under 30 years old to be sterilized so they can't have kids. And all the women read this, and it's all very trendy now to get sterilized before the age of 30. Um, and basically, she, while she was busy writing love letters to Hitler and saying how great his population control policies were, uh, she was setting up all these abortion clinics in poor areas of Britain. And who did she leave her estate to when she died? Well, the Eugenic Society, better known today as the Galton Institute, which, according to its own website, promotes funding, quote, for the practical delivery of family planning facilities, especially in developing countries. So in other words, the same organization that once advocated sterilizing black people to achieve racial purity in the same vein as the Nazis, as Marie Stoke wrote her love, love letters to Adolf Hitler, is now bankrolling the abortion of black babies in the third world. And of course, you can trace the same trajectory back to uh, Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood, of course, they're in the United States. They also set up all the abortion clinics in the poor areas, in the areas where black people lived. Um, and Sanger was on record as a racist to advocate the sterilization of black people. And of course, she was also part of the Galton Institute, formerly the Eugenic Society. So no surprise that modern day abortionists now cite the um, necessity to get rid of, quote, ugly black babies as part of their job, because that's the bottom line about abortion. It has its roots in racism, in the elite's war against the poor, which makes it all the more ironic that today abortion is supported by the uh, loving liberal trendy left who accuse everyone else of being racist um, while upholding something that has its very foundations in racism. Moving on to global news now, Russian general denies reports he was killed by FSA. Russian general Vladimir Petrovich denied reports he was killed by Syrian rebels on Wednesday Quote, I wish to confirm that I am live and well, he told reporters in Moscow. He did not mention when he last visit visited Damascus. Quote, my phone hasn't stopped ringing all day, he told Russia's Interfax news agency. The Free Syrian Army, of course, run, commanded by al-Qaeda forces, the new good guys, announced Wednesday that its men had killed a Russian general who was an advisor to former Syrian defense minister Daoud Raj. Raj himself was killed in an attack in Damascus several weeks ago. And once again, you've got to hand it to the London Guardian, because, of course, after that glowing article last week in which they celebrated and praised the fact that al-Qaeda is now running the rebels, you know, training them to make bombs, meeting with the FSA, quote, every day. Well, today, the Guardian had a headline which read something like, you know, Syrian rebels kill Russian general. So they've gone from basing events in Syria off of random anonymous tweets sent in by dubious activists, you know, and adding the proviso, this cannot be confirmed or verified, to just brazenly now reporting false events that top Russian generals have been killed because they're so desperate um, to big up these Syrian rebels who in actual fact are losing most of the major battles. They lost another one in Aleppo today. Media isn't keen on reporting that. So they've just now resorted to pumping out outright lies and known disinformation. This Russian general turns up and says, what are you talking about? I'm alive, I'm in Moscow. 
So it's funny, isn't it, that when the um, Syrian rebels announced they've killed TV reporters like they did last week, the Guardian isn't really that interested in it. You know, when the Syrian rebels go into tribal areas and slaughter whole tribes who won't bow down to these Al-Qaeda, NATO-backed rebels, uh, the loving lefty interventionist media isn't so interested in that. When they actually don't kill anybody but just lie about it and claim they did, then they report it as gospel. So again, the Guardian playing its role as a 24-hour rolling mouthpiece for the NATO-backed insurgency in Syria. Uh, and don't forget, of course, that now according to the Guardian, the Council on Foreign Relations and Brand Corporation, Al-Qaeda are now our allies. You know, we were never at war with Eurasia. The terrorist attacks are good and moral. Slaughtering people in cold blood is good. Um, and they're basically getting the job done. Of course, they won't mention the fact that the Al-Qaeda fighters were put there by NATO, by the puppet Libyan government in the first place, others coming in from Iraq and Turkey. Um, but simultaneously, they, they're citing the presence of Al-Qaeda fighters in Syria as a reason to invade. So it's all, you know, completely Orwellian again. Down is up, black is white. But so-called Russian general killed turned out to be a completely bogus story, no retraction whatsoever from the pro-NATO media. US news now, gun owner saves cop's life by shooting deranged gunmen. This is out of guns.com. Now here's another story, uh, basically of a citizen using a gun in a positive way to prevent a potential massacre, which is why you'll never hear about it on the network mainstream media. It all began innocently enough, states this report, as a squabble over dogs. David Michael House, 58, and Iris Valentina Kalachi, 53, were both residents at the Peach House RV Park in Central Texas. They were also dog owners, and their pooches allegedly had a nasty habit of relieving themselves on the lawn of neighbor Charles Ronald Connor, 58. And so briefly what happened was the pooches relieved themselves, shot Cora on his property, and... Connor goes absolutely nuts, grabs his gun, shoots dead his neighbor. Um, the uh, the woman in, in the other neighbor, who was the woman, goes off running and screaming. He guns her down cold blood execution style. So when the cop arrives shortly after, Sergeant Stephen Means, he's also coming under fire from this deranged nutcase. And he's shielded behind his car, whereas Connor is... Uh, more protected as he stands behind a nearby tree. So basically, another neighbor comes out with his gun, Vic Stacy, uh, and it looks like the, the nutcase is actually going to kill the cop because he's bearing down on him. He's got better protection. Looks like he's going to waste the cop. Uh, so this other neighbor takes out his legally owned firearm and basically guns the nutcase down, saves the cop's life, and probably saved more people's lives based on uh, the insanity of where this situation was leading. So, of course, when the police arrived, they arrested the guy who saved the cop's life. Um, but he explained to the other police that this guy had actually saved his life, stopped the murderer, and potentially stopped a massacre. So, again, it's just like the old guy in, you know, the Florida library where he, he gets his concealed carry out and chases off the armed intruders, shoots at them. And it's another case of uh, a positive use of the gun, which is why the media are never going to touch it, because they're locked in this campaign to demonize the Second Amendment in the aftermath of these shootings, which is why these stories see them, you know, almost every week. But you will never see them covered uh, on the big news networks because they just don't want people to know that a gun is a neutral object, believe it or not, and it can be used for good or bad. Uh, and in many cases, it's used for good and to stop potential massacres. That's what they don't want you to know. Five ways you don't realize movies are controlling your brain. This is out of Cracked.com. This isn't some paranoid conspiracy theory. It's a fundamental part of how human culture came about. Ask yourself, why do we go and watch superhero movies? After all, variations of these stories about brave superhuman heroes predate recorded history. We used to tell them around campfires before written language even existed. They were created as a way to teach you how to behave. And basically it talks about, you know, thousands of years ago, before parchment, before written record, 
these campfire stories were told in order to encourage the other members of the tribe to go and fight the other tribe. From the article, they were taught, you know, why we hate the tribe across the river, why our tribe is better than that tribe, why it's important to go off and fight in the next war, no matter how scared you are. So this article illustrates how basically archetypes and role models which have been used throughout human history for good, for the protection of a tribe to fight the next tribe over, have basically been hijacked. Hijacked by the movie industry and by the entertainment industry in general to brainwash the public. And it's a point I've made over and over again, which is why do you think the public is engaging in increasingly you know, aberrant and bizarre behavior? Why do we see more and more mass shootings? Why are kids acting like, you know, the droogs out of Clockwork Orange? Well, it's because in entertainment, movies, media in general, our positive role models have been taken away. They've been eviscerated, deliberately so. And on top of that, it's, it's now common knowledge that to borrow all that military equipment to make an action movie like you know, Transformers or something with lots of explosions, lots of military vehicles in it. You don't only need the consent of the Pentagon, the military industrial complex, to make that movie. You need to give them a role in actually writing the script. This is all admitted now. It's not a conspiracy theory. So that's why you see every major action movie is pro-US military. It's pro-intervention, pro-invasion, pro-war. So this article basically exemplifies how not only do they take the archetypes and role models and make them pro-war, um, basically everything about the movie is intended to hark back to that ancient tribalism and gear people up to accept, to support the next war, whatever war that may be. And they give another example of how um, these movies are not only used to brainwash people to change their thought patterns, but their actual behaviour Consider this, after Jaws hit theatres, we nearly drove sharks to extinction with feverish hunting to the point that their populations may never recover. Every single person who saw that movie knew that it was fiction, knew the characters were just actors, but in real life, they knew there isn't a shark big enough to eat your boat. When the genius science character in the movie agreed that killing the shark was the only way to prevent dead tourists, we assumed that part was true. So we killed all the sharks, based on what the make-believe movie told us. So they're basically making the point that, and there's other examples in there, these movies not only shape patterns of thoughts, they not only brainwash people into supporting modern-day tribalism, the hijacked version of it, which of course is war, but they also actually directly uh, alter and shape people's behaviour. So I urge you to read that. Five ways you don't realise movies are controlling your brain at crack.com, very interesting article. Now, Kurt Haskell, this is Kurt Nimmo out of Infowars.com. Kurt Haskell wins House of Representatives primary in Michigan. Michigan attorney Kurt Haskell has beaten his opponent in the August 7th primary for a seat in the House of Representatives. Haskell defeated fellow Democrat Ruben Marquez and Mulfaith Republican Tim Wahlberg in November. Wahlberg is the current representative for Michigan's 7th Congressional District. And of course, as you know from his many appearances on the Alex Jones Show and Infowars Nightly News, Kurt Haskell was the eyewitness who blew the lid off the staged underwear bomber case, where of course he tried to, um, or he was set up as a patsy to smuggle the underwear bomb on the plane. Uh, Haskell saw him being helped on the plane, despite the fact he had no passport, by a well-dressed man. Uh, and, of course, all the other inconsistencies with that story that we've exposed at length. So, basically, just a bit of good news. I mean, this is a guy that's he's had his battles with the system. He's been, they've tried to silence him at every turn, but he's got back onto the field, and now he's starting to kick some butt. He's beaten his Democratic opponent in the primary, and now he's going on uh, to have a shot at becoming a congressman uh, if he defeats this Republican. So basically all of us here at Infowars.com wish Kurt Haskell the best of luck in defeating his opponent because, of course, he will be become, hopefully, one of the precious few moral and upstanding members of Congress. So exciting and positive news there with Kurt Haskell potentially uh, becoming a congressman. Now we're going to throw to David Knight, who's going to talk about free speech zones and how they're increasing the use of them. 
as well as an interesting story about how the GSA was told by the Obama administration in the early days of the Occupy Wall Street movement not to interfere with the Occupy protesters. So here we go to David Knight. Thank you, Paul. This is David Knight reporting for InfoWars. George Washington once said, the British walked about freely, but between high walls. Well, that's quite literally true today in America. Today, at political events, free speech is restricted to political zones, free speech zones, sometimes to caged areas. This is what free speech looks like in 2004 at the Republican National Convention. And in a case that goes back to that convention, an appeals court today has upheld corralling free speech into zones. A federal appeals court has upheld the creation of no demonstration zones which prohibit free speech in certain public areas. The Second Court of Appeals ruled yesterday upholding a lower court's decision that declared such zones as being permissible. A federal appeals court has upheld the creation of no demonstration zones which prohibit free speech in certain public areas. The Second Court of Appeals ruled yesterday upholding a lower court's decision that declared such zones as being permissible. Back in 2004, two pro-life demonstrators were protesting at the Republican National Convention. They were protesting the fact that there were too many pro-abortion speakers, people such as Giuliani, Schwarzenegger. They were told that they could not stand on a public sidewalk holding a sign and they had to go to a remotely located free speech zone. Well, the so-called free speech zone had, as I put it, individuals of varying and opposite opinions forced to stand together in one consolidated caged area, which included a stage with a microphone. Well, as unconstitutional as this was, they didn't refuse to go. But as they were walking, they questioned the officers and recorded the questions. And for doing this, they were arrested for not relocating fast enough. They said they took us to an abandoned warehouse where they funneled hundreds of people into cages that they had set up for this purpose. They treated us like cattle. Well, they treated them like cattle because they think of them as cattle. They don't think of them as American citizens with recognized rights. At no time did these defendants have their case heard by a jury. Their lawsuit was thrown out by a single judge and the appeal was heard by a three-judge panel who sided with the government. No surprise there. The New York Civil Liberties Union has another case relating to the same events, but not to these, these particular abortion protesters. And Christopher Dunn says that that case should not be affected by uh, this recent ruling for the two abortion protesters. This decision involving two anti-abortion protesters has no bearing on the major convention litigation now pending in federal district court said Christopher Dunn, Associate Legal Director for the New York Civil Liberties Union. In that litigation, the New York Civil Liberties Union is challenging mass arrests, detentions at Pier 57, and the blanket fingerprinting of protesters. Get that, blanket fingerprinting of protesters. The appeals case decided yesterday has nothing to do with any of these issues. Well, things are going to get more dangerous for citizens who want to exercise their free speech at this year's convention because earlier this year, Congress passed the Federal Restricted Buildings and Grounds Improvement Act. Well, what exactly does that improve? Well, it just improves the chances that our leaders can now do whatever they wish without anyone complaining about it. Because if you protest an event where the Secret Service is guarding someone, it is now a federal crime. This new law permits Secret Service agents to designate any place they wish as a place where free speech association, petition of the government, are prohibited. It permits the Secret Service to make these determinations based on the content of the speech. That's right, if they don't like what you're saying, they can deny you the right to say it. Cheering crowds are fine, but if the Secret Service arbitrarily doesn't like what you're doing, it's a federal crime. And as we saw yesterday, the Obama White House has already told GSA to step down on Occupy protesters. So if the government finds what you're saying is useful to their agenda, they tell enforcement to step down. But if they don't like what you're saying, they use the full force of unconstitutional laws against you. So our quote for the day is the First Amendment itself. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. I get that again. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or the right of the people to peaceably assemble. This is David Knight reporting for InfoWars Nightly News. Back to you, Paul. Thanks, David. Now we're going to go to a clip, a video we put together earlier today. We really want this to go viral. It's entitled Full Spectrum Evil Secrets of Global Domination. And in this video, Alex Jones 
uses the games of chess, Monopoly, and Risk uh, to illustrate and explain the classic modes of control used by our rulers and how they use these different techniques to enslave us. So let's go to the clip. Alex Jones here to cover a topic, an issue, that is one of the most important I've ever discussed. This information is very closely held by governments and elite corporations. They do not want you understanding this. Now, many of you that are already aware of this, it'll seem simple, but large swaths of the global population have no idea the real geopolitical paradigm that we're living in today. Today, we will look at the real forces, the real players in the battle for 21st century global hegemony. I'm gonna break down who really rules the world, how they control the planet, and how they are trying to usher in a world war that is really pointed at the general population. To begin my illustration, I have three different board games here. Chess, the classic game of Risk, as well as Monopoly. And we're gonna look at these systems of stylized warfare. And between these three systems, we find the truth of the system that we're living under. How do we know that system? Well, books written by people like Carol Quigley at Georgetown, Bill Clinton's mentor. They think we're stupid, and so we have their own documents. To begin with, I'm going to use a Lego chess set as a illustration to break down primitive forms of government, warfare, and domination. If you look at this set, you notice there are two sides. There is the red and there is the green, or there is the black, there is the white. From the beginnings of civilization more than 6,000 years ago until about 1700, this was the model of warfare between nations. There were occasional alliances, but by and large, warfare and politics was carried out in a very two-dimensional way, like a chess set. You have the ruling class, the royalty, the priest class, the military elite, the generals, and in front of them, you have basically their conscripts or the lower class fighters, who can also represent just the general population. And these two groups are engaged in warfare and base domination against each other to control larger areas of land and the vassal populations living in serfdom upon it. One area that we see from the ancient chess model that is still used in statecraft by the globalist is the fact that sometimes wars were launched, in the case of the French and the British, against each other when they had rebellions at home. They soon learned it was a way to turn inner anger at the state against a foreign state and to reduce the population of young males that you didn't have jobs for. The two-sided fight is a bygone era. In truth, for more than 300 years, the globalists have been financing multiple sides of wars, knowing that conflict destroys nations and gets countries deep into debt. And that is the key. They're financing both sides. And we see this being pioneered by people like the Rothschilds, starting in the 17 and 1800s, where they would finance sometimes three or four different factions, and it didn't matter who won, because all of them were in debt to them and had societies that were wrecked after the wars. Next, let's look at the game of risk. These are primitive attempts to distill down human conflict and domination into a game you can play in a few hours. The militaries all have basically equal resources, equal numbers of troops, and to enter into the equation some type of random probability, we have dice and we have cards. There is no discussion here on looking at the real model that we are under today. We're gonna to come back to risk here in a moment, but first let's move to the game of Monopoly. In the game of Monopoly, you have different economic groups or four players that attempt to engage in economic warfare against each other and then be able to create a monopoly or a single entity that is in control of New York City. To understand the real system we're under, it's important to combine monopoly and risk with an overlay of strategy from chess. And this is a key part of the real system we live under today. 
The founder of the Rockefeller dynasty famously said that competition was a sin. And they wanted big governments that they financed and control to be able to shut down their competition and pick winners and losers. This is the essence of monopoly capitalism, the opposite of free market, and is simply a form of fascism, what Mussolini called corporatism. So out of these three board games, monopoly best describes our modern system. But it itself is only two-dimensional. You see, the private Federal Reserve that's owned by six private banks, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, and others, they always win. You're playing their game. You think you're battling it out for houses and apartments and for Park Place and for the electric company and for the railroad and for the top hat and for the fashion show. But it's the bankers that control the politicians. They've got the get-out-of-jail-free card. And they've got control of the money. The treasury works for them. So the bank always wins. But what happens if a country won't sell? What happens if an African nation uh, won't play the monopoly game? Or what happens if a Middle Eastern country doesn't want to be part of the modern bankster system based in London and New York? Well, then that's where risk comes in because they want to be able to take you over through economic espionage, as John Perkins has written in his bestseller, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. But if they can't, this is in all the official CIA and State Department documents, they will then come and finance your neighbor to attack you. So Libya is not playing ball. It's building up and industrializing all of Africa. You want a global monopoly. You just play countries off against each other. You're a globalist. You've made yourselves exempt with diplomatic immunity at the United Nations. Who set that up? The robber barons. What do you do? You just have Al-Qaeda come out of Egypt into Libya, ethnically cleanse, blow up most of the infrastructure, knock out Gaddafi, and now... They have to come to you and borrow money out of your bank to rebuild and you own and control everything. And guess what? If you want to get that welfare check, well, you got to take the vaccines, which, by the way, sterilize you. So they're using the strategy of chess, but they're employing it through a monopolistic system where they have a monopoly on the issuance of currency and credit. And they also have the biggest militaries on Earth from the United States and Europe controlled and dominated 100% by them. They've announced that we're totally their slaves. And they have such disdain for us, they use our supposed enemy Al-Qaeda against the Russians, against the Serbs, and now against other Middle Eastern nations while simultaneously telling us we need military-style occupation within our countries by the TSA and the military to keep us safe from Al-Qaeda, who they sponsored and created. And remember, the banksters are openly crowing and bragging that they have conquered you through monopoly capitalism. The question is, do we all work for central bankers? That's what I want to address to our guest tonight. Is this global governance at last? Is it one world, the central bankers in charge? Aren't we all just living and dying for what the central banks do? To answer your question, we are absolutely slaves to central banks. And they weren't able to do this because they had better products. They were able to do it because they created, through fractional reserve banking here in the U.S. and similar systems worldwide, unlimited free credit for themselves, which they then loan out to you at interest. But that wasn't enough of a fraud for them. In the last 20 years, they've deployed derivatives, completely made up counterfeit instruments to the tune of more than 1.5 quadrillion. That's 1,000 500 trillion. With that counterfeit money, they were able to buy up all of their competition, pay off the governments, and dominate defense industries as well as media to carry out their propaganda. And herein lies the big secret that they don't want you to know the big secret hiding in plain view. We think about nations and continents and cultures, but in truth, the globalist, the bankers who have unlimited money, 
They're waging war against anyone else that has any assets because they want everyone to be impoverished, so you have to go to them and so that you have to follow all of their orders so they can control human development and society. In the past, they would brag about their real political system in fictional accounts, in movies like Network. Let's analyze a clip of that. There is no America. There is no democracy. There is only IBM and ITT and AT&T and DuPont, Dow, Union Carbide and Exxon. One vast and ecumenical holy country for whom all men will work to serve a common profit in which all men will hold a share of stock. Oh, there are no more peoples. There are no more nations, Mr. Beale. Each one of us has one piece of stock in the global system, one ecumenical giant global government. <gasps> Except one thing, that big global corporate system they've been selling us on doesn't want us to even be alive. It's designed to consolidate control and then slowly cut off the resources while the banksters themselves pose as the saviors, selling people on getting deeper into the tyranny and the pain will stop. When at the end of the tunnel is nothing but global extermination and eugenics so that these selfish, greedy scam artists can have the world and all of the incredible technology and life extension for themselves. And that's the big secret here. You have been warned. I'm Alex Jones signing off for Infowars.com. The ball is in your court. The rest is up to you. Please get this presentation out to everyone you know. We've got to understand the enemy we're facing if we have any chance of defeating these people. Humanity hangs in the balance. Going to go to a break now on InfoWars Nightly News. Coming up after the break, Rob Dew talks to Liz Reitzig of formfoodfreedom.org. And again, I urge you to sign up at prisonplanet.tv. That's our subscription website. You get to see this show first at prisonplanet.tv. You get access to, the, to all the archives. It's been going since 2004, so there's just a ton of multimedia content on there, a lot of which is not on YouTube. And it's all in one place. Every Alex Jones film features special events, audio archives, video archives. And it's what, it's what funds this network. We couldn't do it without your support at prisonplanet.tv. You can still get the 15-day free trial. And, of course, our other new uh, offensive in the info war is planetinfowars.com. That's the social network uh, which is taking the web by storm. Tens of thousands of members already. You can host your own blog, you can arrange activist events, meet people in your area, get together with like-minded people. There's a dating section as well. You can host your own blog. And it's all free, and it's all at planetinfowars.com. Sign up today. Stay tuned. Alex Jones here with a message to fellow freedom lovers. The prognosis for the entire planetary economic system runs from bad to worse. The globalist model is to shut down societies and starve patriots out until they acquiesce to the global takeover. That's why we've assembled the most vital and important preparedness items at InfoWarsShop.com. These are items that I did research on, that I personally use. We've got the life straw, so you can turn fetid water into safe water anywhere you go. The KTOR hand crank generator to charge up key equipment during power outages or out in the field. Strategic relocation, third edition by Joel Skousen. When disaster strikes by Matthew Stein. Therosafe, used by Homeland Security to protect yourself during any radiological event. Hand crank shortwave AM FM radios. Everything that we've researched and found to be the best is available at InfoWarsShop.com and your purchase makes our InfoWar possible. We're getting prepared. Are you? InfoWarsShop.com
Sick of the globalist eugenicist control freaks adding poison to your water and laughing as you get sick and die? Start purifying your water with ProPure. My friends, I've done a lot of research, and the best gravity filter out there, bar none, is ProPure. And it's available discounted at Infowars.com. Its filters are silver impregnated to prevent bacterial growth. There's no priming required. It's NSF 42 certified. Optional fluoride filters can reduce fluoride up to 95%. Easy to set up and use. Doesn't require electricity. Purify water from lakes, streams, ponds, and wells. This filter system leaves in beneficial minerals, which is key. Save money by not buying bottled water and avoid BPA that leaches from the plastic. ProPure is the best gravity-fed filter out there. It's what my family uses. Infowars.com already has the lowest price on ProPure, but if you add the promo code WATER at checkout, you get an additional 10% off at Infowars.com. You can also call to order 888-253-3139. Welcome back to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Dew. Thanks to Paul Joseph Watson over there in England for doing the news portion and to David Knight for sitting in. He's visiting us right now. He's one of the finalists in the reporter contest. And you may be asking yourself, why is Rob Dew holding a glass of milk? Well, this is not ordinary milk. This is evil Al-Qaeda raw milk. This is what the FDA is going after people for, for selling it, for traveling with it across state lines. Here it is. I mean, this... Look at the deadliness in this milk. And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to drink some. Mm. Wow. Man, that is just the taste of freedom there. Speaking of freedom, we have with us one of the raw milk freedom riders, Liz Reitzig. She was a mother trying to get milk for her kids after they had uh, they're having allergies. I'm going to let her tell you the story. But basically, it became illegal for her to get the type of food she wanted to feed her family. So without further ado, we turn to Liz Reitzig. How you doing, Liz? Hi, Rob. Great. Thanks so much for having me on. No problem. It's, uh, so tell us your story. Why did you get into the raw milk freedom movement? Well, basically, like you said, it was just I was trying to find good, healthy, wholesome food for my children. And we, for a small time, we had a cow share in Maryland until that became illegal. And then we started getting raw milk from uh, out of state. And that is illegal also because it's, it's illegal for people to transport raw milk intended for human consumption across state lines. Wow. So, oh, so it's, it's actually it's, illegal to share a cow where you can get, what, 12 gallons of milk a day out of a cow, but you can't share it with another family in Maryland, and you also can't just go out and get it. So you had to go across state lines and effectively break Maryland law. And also, is that a federal law that you're breaking as well? Well, yeah, it, it's a federal regulation that makes it illegal to transport raw milk across state lines. And technically, it's not illegal to own it or consume it anywhere, but that act of transporting it across state lines is a federal offense. It's always in the details. Uh, the devil's in the details, as they say. So you sent me a press release on uh, August 3rd, Mothers to Risk Jail Over Lemonade or milk. Farmers, others criminalized for feeding communities. And you guys are going to hold an event later on this month in D.C. Why don't you tell us all about it? Okay, it's, it's an event. It's two groups coming together, Lemonade Freedom Day and the Raw Milk Freedom Riders. And we're really coming together to celebrate our freedom for voluntary exchange. So we're getting together on the lawn of the Capitol Reflecting Pool. And we're just going to engage in peaceful, voluntary exchange for the foods of our choice. This is a very simple, very clear event. And our message is simply that if the regulations interfere with the voluntary exchange, we will not comply. I like that. We will not comply with these people who think they can step all over us and tell us what to do, tell us what to think, tell us how to act, tell us where we can have our free speech. That was another story we covered tonight and how... Now the federal courts are upholding free speech zones, which is a total travesty. And, and you guys are voluntary exchange. We want to have the ability anytime we want. If, we, if I want to give somebody something and somebody wants to take it, that's okay. You know, right. Especially milk. Here, and here it is, once again, the milk. So uh, how many people are you expecting at this event? Well, um, several hundred. Well, Lots we need to get fun. more than that. We need several thousand. That would be wonderful. And, and where can people find out information about this event? Well, they can go to rawmilkfreedomriders.com or lemonadefreedom.com. Right. And, and the Lemonade Freedom, I guess you guys banded with the group who was 
they were selling lemonade for 10 cents a glass on the lawn. They were arrested uh, viciously by the cops. And uh, also, it reminds me of another event where uh, Adam Kokesh led a group of people who were silent dancing at the Jefferson Memorial, another outlawed event at our nation's capital, a place that we built with our tax money. Right, and that was actually organized by Eddie Free, and he also organized the lemonade stand on the lawn of the Capitol last year, and he is a big part of this event as well. And Rob Fernandez, he's the founder of Lemonade Freedom Day, and we're, we're organizing it together, you know, to, to bring this celebration to the forefront that we actually do have this right to voluntary exchange and that we're going to engage in that and we're not going to comply with the regulations and we will suffer the consequences if that's what it's going to take. Are you expecting a violent response from the Global Love Cops when they see you exchanging this milk voluntarily? No, we're not expecting that. We're expecting to just peacefully engage in normal, natural human behavior to, to get the foods of our choice from the producers of our choice. And hopefully we'll be just left alone to do just that. Wow. Well, hopefully they will leave you alone and let you guys do that. It, it seems like when people push the system, they do back down but then they ratchet it up again later. So it's like a constant situation of where we have to keep pushing, keep prodding, keep telling them to stay out of our business. Otherwise, they're not going to stop. They, you know, they'll take one step forward to two steps back, essentially. Right. And the reason we're doing this, one of the main reasons, is because of the uh, aggression against our farmers. It's time to take some of the pressure off our farmers. And, you know, we all enjoy the foods that they produce. But yet, how many of us are willing to, to risk what the farmers are, are risking every day by getting us these amazing foods? Right, and speaking of that, we've had the FDA actually have chased a farmer basically out of his profession. They've, they've kind of forced him to voluntarily stop selling his milk. Why don't you tell us about Mr. Algier? Well, Dan Algier was just peacefully supplying food to a community here in D.C., and the FDA found out that he was producing milk that was being transported across state lines. And they went after him viciously. They conducted a two and a half year long undercover investigation on the buying club. They conducted numerous armed raids on his farm. And they, they filed a, um, a permanent injunction against him. And then they, they filed a motion for the, for the judge to sign a, um, a, a, a motion of summary judgment, basically so that the judge would sign off that he was guilty without actually having any trial and the judge granted that motion and with it came horrible consequences for dan and his family and so he thought it was wise at that point to not risk having armed federal marshals on his farm at any time he does have small children so he opted to stop producing rather than risk that yeah and these dogs will come on your property they'll shoot your dogs if they bark you know, they'll, they'll claim that you pulled a gun on them, even though you're just opening the door. And what really gets me is one of, one of the quotes in here. After a two-year expensive, exhaustive undercover operation, including multiple arm raids on Alger's farm, FDA agents and a team of 10 federal lawyers amassed 276 pages of evidence, allegedly proving that Alger openly admits that he is selling fresh, raw, unpasteurized milk to customers who knowingly carry the milk across state lines. I mean, it's comical right. and it's absurdity to sit. This is a, supposedly a free country. We supposedly fight the terrorists for our freedom, yet we don't have the freedom to drink milk. That's right. And if you look at it from the, the production perspective, the people who are actually producing something for our economy and selling it to people who want this product, they're the ones being criminalized. They're creating jobs. You know, when a farm is productive and when a farm is making money, they're creating jobs for their community and they're putting money back into their rural communities. And they're the ones being criminalized. And, that, and that's <laughs> one of the main ways these people do make money is by selling it to these local communities. They're, they're not selling out to these giant agribusinesses. They're not having, you know, these Tyson chicken farms that spring up everywhere. Yeah, these guys have... They don't seem to get regulated at all, even though their chickens are walking around without beaks and feathers and, and, and stuff like that. And then they go after the little guy over and over again with a white glove is what it seems to me. And what's your perspective on that? Well, actually, they're not going after them with a white glove. They're going after them with guns and handcuffs. There you go. Uh, let's move over to Canada. Uh, what, what's the case of Michael Schmidt and his rare breed of sheep? Tell us a little bit about that. 
Well, they actually were not Michael's sheep. They were, they belonged to a farmer named Montana Jones. And what happened was several months ago, um, the CFIA, the, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, they had a quarantine order on Montana Jones' entire herd because at one point, one sheep that she had so sold to another farm years ago tested positive for scrapie. Now, without any further testing, they condemned her entire herd of sheep. And she, she worked, and, and several people worked, to have another level of testing for those sheep rather than just slaughter them all. And CFIA said no, and they were going to slaughter them. So the morning that they came out to slaughter the sheep, the sheep were gone, and there was a note from a group calling themselves the Farmers Peace Corps saying that the sheep had been taken into protective custody, still in quarantine, until a better solution could be found or at least talked about rather than just arbitrary slaughter of the entire herd. Now, now keep in mind, this is a, a genetically rare sheep that they were slaughtering. So because of that, the CFIA went on this hunt for the sheep. And early in June, about June 13th, they found those sheep on a farm and immediately slaughtered them. Now, Michael Schmidt, he came out and made a public statement about that and said that knowingly, he was, he was acting on behalf of the Farmers Peace Corps and he knew that because of that, he might suffer the consequences. And sure enough, a couple days later, they raided his farm and they did it again last week, this time taking all of his electronics, his computers, everything. But Michael is, is incredibly peaceful and he just has an amazing way of dealing with all of this. And, um, he's, I mean, he's handling it all so well, but they do want to charge him and the farmer and two others with conspiracy charges. Wow. And this is something we've seen in Michigan. Uh, we had a, a pig farmer there. They were going after it. They said his pigs were in, infected with the wild pig genes or, you know, they're part wild pig. So, just because they didn't look like a pink pig, you know, they may have been a brown pig or a spotted pig. Well, we got to kill all the pigs. And it's just this one size fits all to any situation. The government always has one problem, which is either kill it, get rid of it, or put it in jail. That's right. And it's, it's also very interesting to look at how these things happen in conjunction on both sides of the border. So a few years ago, there was massive crackdowns on raw milk farmers in Canada and in the U.S. And now they're uh, in Canada and the U.S., they're both targeting genetically rare breeds of, of animals. Right, and we're seeing this between both countries. They're, they're creating all these treaties, these North American treaties, the Free Trade Organization of the Americas. Even, even though none of it has to do with free trade, it all has to do with corporate control over this stuff and limiting our choices. And anything organic or raw milk, for instance, you know, anything that isn't under the the regulation microscope of these people, they just want to do away with because it's seen as a threat to their existence, essentially. Well, they want to regulate it out of existence, yeah. In some right. Cases. So uh, where can people go to find out more information? You have two main websites. Well, for uh, anything related to the Michael Schmidt case, um, farmfoodfreedom.org, we have information about that. And for the Lemonade and Raw Milk Freedom Day, you can go to rawmilkfreedomriders.com or lemonadefreedom.com. Awesome. Well, I, I hope the uh, Global Love Cops do not ex exert violence over you guys when you're voluntarily uh, exchanging milk. If they do, though, please have plenty of video cameras there to catch it on tape because uh, everybody out there in YouTube land you know, we need more evidence. If it, as if there isn't enough evidence, we need more evidence that these people are tyrannical, you know, jerks essentially, and that we just have to keep pointing it out every step of the way as we reclaim our rights. We will be live streaming the day of the event. We will also be live streaming the rights workshop the evening before, and people are welcome to come and join us and watch us on live stream. It's on both of those websites I mentioned. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, we'd love to have people involved in that. Oh, that's so. right. You're going to tell people about their rights? Yeah, we're having a rights workshop on Friday before the event and, and just a, a basic training course for people so they understand, like, a history of peaceful noncompliance and how to stand up for your rights and what to do in the case of conflict, how to, how to maintain peace. Well, excellent. Positive, positive change going out there for the people. Appreciate you coming on and telling us about it. Good luck with your event. Um, on it's August 17th and 18th, I believe. Is that right? That's correct. Thanks. All right.
Well, you can check more out about it at uh, farmfoodfreedom.org or rawmilkfreedomwriters.com. Thank you, Liz Reitzig. Thanks, Rob. You have a good day. You too. All right, and that is our show for today. I uh, finished my glass of milk, my evil Al-Qaeda milk, while I was talking to Liz. It was great. I feel nourished. I feel healthy. And you know what I like about the raw milk is that they tell you the day it was pumped out of the cow or milked out of the cow, they, uh, which was, in this case, it was August 3rd. Um, unlike the milk you buy at the regular stores, which it tells you the date it's good and tell. And I like to know when my milk actually comes out of the cow. I appreciate that. I'm not making light of the things here by you know, drinking milk on camera and doing this stuff like that. Actually, we have a movie that really goes in depth to this problem. It's called Farmageddon. And if you haven't seen it, it is really an amazing movie. It's done by first-time director Kristen Canty. And it explores, I'm just going to read the back here. Americans' right to access fresh, healthy foods of their choice is under attack. Farmageddon tells the story of small family farms that were providing safe, healthy foods to their communities and were forced to stop, sometimes through violent action, uh, by agents of misguided government bureaucracies and seeks to figure out why. This is a really good movie, and if you haven't seen it, you can get it at InfoWarsShop.com. You can go to our online store. It's another way to support us, and we really appreciate it. And we can always use the support. So check out Farmageddon at InfoWarsShop.com. That's our show for today. Thanks to Paul Joseph Watson and David Knight for both stepping up and doing the news portion. I'm Rob Dew. Don't forget, if you're not a member of PrisonPlanet.tv, it's the way we make this happen. Uh, this is it. PrisonPlanet.tv gets the reporters here. It pays for the cameras, pays for the lights, pays for the light bulbs. Uh, we got all kinds of stuff. You can watch the nightly news. You can watch the daily show. We have all of Alex's movies, uh, plus some other movies. Other people have given us permission to, to host on there. Uh, both of Alex, uh, Alex's book and Paul Joseph Watson's books, Alex's rant section. Lots of stuff there. We have a 15-day free trial. If you're watching this on YouTube for free right now, please consider becoming a member. It really does support us. And we are not funded by George Soros or Time Warner or GE or any other military industrial complex out there. We are funded by you out there. So please consider becoming a member of PrisonPlanet.tv. And with that, that's our show. We'll see you again tomorrow. Keep fighting for freedom.